like what you input to your mind musically is the most important thing. Like the amount of time you spend studying other people, great people, like don't just listen to um, what everyone else is listening to. Make sure you go and research like the best of the best because then you're getting the shortcuts and like the, you're, you're gonna, your palate is gonna be, you know, that much better, 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 better. Yeah, yeah, check it out. I'm your host, Corey Cambridge. Uh, yeah. Everybody tuning in, you invited, you invited. No matter what mood you in, get excited, get excited. Everybody love the music, let me tell you how they do it. Whether writer or an agent, let me tell you how they made it. You are now talking to a silent giant. Wanna walk in their shoes, silent giants. Wanna study they move, silent giants. Wanna know what they do, silent giants. Silent giants, y'all. <laughs> Welcome to the Silent Giants Podcast, a podcast highlighting the superstars behind your favorite superstars in creative industries. I'm your host, Corey Cambridge. To keep up with the latest on the show, be sure to follow us on Instagram at, at Silent Giants Podcast. Also, to keep up with my life, music, and more, be sure to follow me as well at, at Corey Cambridge. Today on the show, we have a very special guest, my friend Ali, producer and Silent Giant behind rap superstar J. Cole. This episode, Lee calls in to share how he became a producer, meeting J. Cole, and gives advice to up-and-coming producers. So without further ado, give a round of applause to my friend, the silent giant, Ali. All right, awesome. Uh, so Ali, welcome to the show, my man. Uh, where are you from originally? Um, well, originally I'm from uh, Connecticut, and oh, I grew up in like Connecticut and Westchester, which is like outside of New York. I went to college at uh, SUNY Purchase, which is also in Westchester. So I spent a lot of my time, you know, growing up like outside of the city, um, about 45 minutes out. It was close enough that we got some of the New York culture, you know, uh, but we were still removed from it. But, you know, we would take the train, Metro North, up to Fordham Road and go to the record shops and, you know, get some of the culture and bring it back. But, um, yeah, so I grew up around there. So what were your earliest memories of, of first falling in love with music? Uh, apparently, the first, the very first thing was um, the movie La Bamba. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to uh, watch the movie La Bamba about Richie Valens, the Richie Valens story, and, like, memorize all the songs and that and sing them and um i think my dad took notice that i was uh so into that movie i would like, rewind it all the time and you know learn the songs and sing them and um my dad was always very supportive and like if he saw that i was passionate about something he would he would he would you know nurture it so i remember he went to the store to get to you know to the record shop to buy me uh, a cassette tape because he was like, all right, well if my son likes music, let me let me get him some music that he could listen to, and um, the first tape that he bought me was Thriller because I guess in his mind he was like, well if he likes music, let me get him the best you know the biggest album ever like so he can so he can start with that and um, so Thriller was really the first cassette or album that I had and. Uh, I pretty much became obsessed with Michael Jackson after that. And, like, I, I think there was a good four-year period where I wouldn't listen to anything that wasn't Michael Jackson when I was a little kid, and I was just obsessed. And um, I think it started there. funny part is the way I got into hip-hop was there was a heavy D-verse on, um, on the Dangerous album on the song called Jam. Yeah. I remember I really liked it, and, like, I told, I asked my mom, I was like, can you get me, um, can you get me a rap album? Like, <laughs> I want to have, I want that, like, whatever that is, like, I want that. I think she got me like MC Hammer or something like, you know, like real commercial and I didn't like it. I didn't, I was like, I didn't <laughs> like it. Um, I think I wanted something more real. Even though I was a little kid, I could feel it, you know, I could just feel it wasn't, um, quite what I was looking for. But, um, you know, I eventually made my way. I, I was into Criss Cross, though. Definitely into Criss Cross because I saw them in the video, so I started getting on them. Maybe Totally Crossed Out might have been my first, like, hip-hop album that I really liked as a, as a little kid, you know? What were your earliest memories of making music, uh, and when did you know that you wanted to, like, be an artist? I guess I started late in high school, maybe my senior year. I had this, I don't know how I found this little program, but I had this computer program. I was, like, into the internet and, like, the computer. Like, I was always on, you know, I was early on America Online and all that stuff. So I was probably just, like, searching the web and finding stuff. I was really into hip-hop in high school. So 
I was digging for music all the time. Um, I was kind of like the kid in high school who had like all like the underground rap stuff i had eminem before he was famous i had like, like all you know i was up on everything and, and um i uh i found this program it was called hip-hop ej and it was kind of like making beats on your playstation where it was like all these pre-made loops that you like could put together and they kind of went to each other and you could like change the tempo or put different bass lines with they're probably all in the same key or whatever it was but um it's a real like elementary way to make music um and I kind of started playing with that. But then once I started doing that, I kind of was hungry to like, you know, oh, I want to, you know, figure out like, how do I, how do I do my own stuff, you know? So I would go on like message boards, um, like rapmusic.com or um, there was another site um, that I used to always go on, uh, Cannabis Central, because I was a big Cannabis fan. Like, we would, you know, it was just all these little websites and stuff. And I kind of just started like linking with people on there and like, figuring out how to do it, um, getting getting help from people and asking questions. And uh, uh, then I started using the program uh, Sony Acid. And once I got onto that, then I kind of started, you know, making my own stuff a little bit more uh, organically. I definitely wanted to rap. Like, that was a thing for a while. Um, and I think making the beats was kind of like, uh, it was like I wanted to do both, you know? Like, I wanted to... Uh, um, I wanted to rap and like battle rap. Like that was the thing at that time was battle rap. I wanted to be like cannabis. Like I wanted to, I wanted to be there. Cause in my high school, they would have like ciphers at the table and stuff. And like, I always thought like, man, if I could rap like cannabis, i will come and kill everybody. You know, like, right. that's like how, that's how I wanted to do it. But like, I wanted to also make my own beats just because, I don't know, you know, you want full create. I wanted just to create. So that was where my mind was at. But, um, Eventually, I started, you know, I had like a group in college, a little rap group, and we started making beats. Um, or I started making beats for them. And one of the beats that I made for us um, actually turned into uh, a song for Drag On that got, that was my first placement called Fireman. How did that come about? Like, how did that, that introduction into the actual music industry happen? Like, how did, how did that beat get to Drag On? Uh, well, it's a kind of a long story, but basically, um, I studied abroad the summer between high school and college. It's kind of like my, my step, my foot in to get into college. I took a course in Spain, um, where it was like a music composition course. And, um, I, I was basically, it was, it said it was music composition, but basically what we were doing, it was really like a, a roadie class like it, we were putting on shows in spain like the whole class and like your job was like you have to contribute somehow to the show whether it's playing an instrument performing doing backline um lights sound loading gear whatever it was like you had to contribute to the to the to the show so that was the class basically it was a really cool class to be honest like we were just doing gigs in spain like every like three days or so and um so what i did was i was like well i can rap so i'll just rap so i was rapping out there like we had like basically we were doing like jam sessions like where like we would have like a jazz you know all these jazz musicians from the from the from the conservatory playing instruments and like me and a couple other kids like rapping they would play like instrument you know they, they, we, they would like replay like dr dre beats or something and we would just like rap over them but like um you know in spain at the time it was like people were loving it and um there was this uh one of the other people who was taking the class um her name was alima dean and she uh is the sister of dean who are the ceos of rough riders and she saw me out there she's a younger sister by the way um not siobhan who's the older sister but okay um she saw me out there and um we became friends like just because we were you know we had similar interests and what and, and music um conversation and like uh she liked you know my rapping and everything so when she saw me she said to me you know she said, oh when we get back to the states you know like my brothers have a studio like you know i'll take you there and i didn't know anything that she was rough riders or nothing like that so i was just like yeah okay like sounds good you know like that sounds fun like at the time i had nothing really going so i was just like fine you know that sounds cool so literally when we got back to the states like she took me to yonkers and like i walked into the studio and like swiss beats was in there with like pit bulls and like it was like straight out of a movie i, I was pretty uh culture shocked 
<laughs> and um, <laughs> she had me like put me on the spot, had me rap for people and like all kind of stuff. I went through like real, real hip hop boot camp out there uh, for a while. And um, it was really good for me, a great experience because I got to kind of experience the culture from the inside. And like um, I got an internship. She got me an internship at, at Powerhouse, which was the studio in Yonkers. Um, basically, I was just, you know, making runs and getting people food or whatever they needed and cleaning up and doing stuff. Um, but everybody kind of knew that, like, I rapped and made beats. And um, uh, eventually, um, Alima, um, she started managing me, basically. That was, like, what she was, you know, the angle she wanted to manage me. So she was managing me. She played one of the beats that I had made for Ice Pick. Jackson, who was at A and R at the time, and um, he gave it to Drag on, and uh, and that was it. And then Drag laid the song down, and uh, uh, that that was the first the first of the Rough Rider days for me. Well, what, what was that feeling like getting that first placement? It was really exciting, but also confusing, and like um, I was young, like I was probably like nineteen, so it was like. I uh, uh, I was excited, but I also didn't quite. It's scary too because you don't know anything. You know what I mean? You don't know how the business works. You don't know. You don't know why they like the song. What's good about it? Like how to do it again? Like there's a lot of like confusion, but also excitement. Um, so you know, it was it was fun, it, it, but it's it's a it's a complicated thing, you know. It's like the very first step. It's like an adrenaline rush, like oh whoa, like people like my stuff, like <laughs> like maybe I'm good, you know. It's like a it's a complicated feeling, but it, it was um, it was exciting, man. Overall, honestly. On, on the on the point of getting to learn the business, you know, how did you navigate that? Being 19, like what were the first steps of like getting the business aspect of being a music producer together? Well, Alima was really good, to be honest, of, like, teaching me stuff because she was around her brothers and everything. So she had a pretty good grasp on the business side of it. Um, So she was pretty good at, like, teaching me stuff. Um, But also, like, there were other producers around um, Rough Riders that were, like, mentoring me and, like, giving me pointers. And, you know, like, I was learning from other people. Like, there was a producer, uh, Divine, who, who worked with Rough Riders, he was always giving me, you know, pointers and telling me about publishing and stuff. And, um, you know, just from learning from, from, the, from, from people around me, really asking questions. I always asked a lot of questions. Like I was, you know, whether it was from the business side or for, you know, like when they were mixing my song, my, my songs, I would sit right next to the engineer and like, just ask questions. Like, like, what are you doing right now? What are you doing to the kick drum? What are you doing right now? Like, what is that? Like, you know, every little thing I was, I just wanted to know. So, like, that's just how I was when I was young because I, I knew that, like, I had a lot to learn. So, you know, that was my mentality. What was your first time meeting J. Cole and how did that relationship uh, relationship start? We actually met on um, on the, the cannabis website that I was talking about before, the Cannabis Center. We were both big fans of cannabis. And, like, once I started doing stuff with Rough Riders, like, I was posting my music. And, you know, talking about it. And um, he sent me a instant message, like, on, on AOL Instant Messenger. I think he was, like, 15 years old at the time. And, like, he was just like, yo, man, like, I rap. Like, I'm dope. You should, hear, you know, you should hear me out. But all he had was, like, written stuff. Like, he just had, like, text, you know, like, verses and stuff. So I was like, that's, you know, it's dope, man. But, like, you know, when you get a song, like, send me a song. Like, if I could hear something. And so, um he went and recorded um, this song. It's called The Storm. Uh, it's a, it, you can find it on YouTube or whatever, but it's actually the first song he ever recorded. My man Sean from around the way, son, been down from day one. Never been known for mistakes, but was bound to make one. Her name was Nina. See, he was all about the cash flow till she came and had this man pussy whipped to the max, yo. A true dime piece describing the brown eyes, caramel skin, thick thighs, goes the yawn speech. But besides looks, some eyes lost. Known for kicking cats to the club, leaving they hearts on the sidewalk. Sean was one of them. And she uh, said he got back to me and he was like, yo, if I recorded a song, like, check it out. And um, his approach was always, like, very confident, which always, like, strokes, uh, struck me. I was like, you know, whoa, like, this kid's confident, you know, for, like, not, for no kind of, like, reference point. I have no reference point to, to know if he's good or not, but he seems confident. And, like, he sent me this song, The Storm, and I was like, you know, 
wow, this is amazing. So I could recognize instantly that this kid was talented. So, um, you know, we started building a relationship, sending music back and forth. Um, and uh, once he came out to, um, he came to visit St. John's because he, he ended up going to school in St. John's. And, you know, I was in New York or the New York area. And um, he came to visit the school before he went. I think we linked up at like in Times Square somewhere and just like had like a rap cipher at Burger King or something <laughs> like that. Like it was some sort of, it, it was something like that. Um, and you know, we just became friends like after we started hanging out and like making music together. Um, you, you know, we, we built our relationship, you know, through that. Once he, once he, once he got to St. John's, we started hanging out and working together more. Uh, so what, what was the first song that uh, you guys collaborated on together? Songs that will probably never be <laughs> that oh, yeah. will ever hear. Songs that aren't uh, before he was even J. Cole, you know, it was like when he was under the name Therapist, like we were doing some stuff. But like um, the first song, I guess that I guess that's like official, like J. Cole song will probably be the song called Playground. This is a playground. But if sick got hard, would you stay down? Would you stand up for me? Would you lay down? Would you skate down on the first grade hand? Hey now, hey, this is a playground. But if sick yeah, he got came hard, to um came to he was recording the warm up with me of a bunch of it at my house in in Westchester. Like so he was he would come and he would have like four songs to record and like I record them for him and like at the end of the session I was like, Look man, like if you're gonna record all these songs, like at least hop on this, hop on one of my beats or something like so he um he got on I played um the playground beat and like he actually did it on the spot. Like he 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 came up with all the raps like um he didn't even write them down like and he doesn't usually do that but like for that one like I remember it was like well let me just try it this way so he just like came up with it on the spot and like that's how that song came about but you know we had done stuff before but I think that was the first one that was like him as J Cole you know so uh, I saw that you are the co executive uh, producer for Your Eyes Only his latest album mm -hmm. uh, what goes into the title of being an executive producer and how does that impact the project? That's a complicated question because I think it's different for every, um, for, for every, you know, case by case. But um, with us, I think it's just a matter of like trust, really. It came down to like me being a second ear along with Ibrahim, who is, you know, his, uh, his manager. Um, it, it came down to like just being another ear, a set of ears that he trusted and could bounce opinions off of. And, um, you know, I did a lot of stuff as far as like actual production work with editing and sequencing and arranging and all that stuff. But I think I, I kind of on this album took on the role of like his extended arm when it came to pr production in general and just getting the album to a point, you know, where he was you know, it was album ready it was from, from demos into full songs and, you know, like picking what songs should be on the album and which ones shouldn't. And, um, you know, not that like I was picking them, but it was, I was, I was an opinion that he was, he was leaning on. The role I took on with this album was helping with any and everything that needed to be done. You know, whether it was recording, whether it was helping him get a better vocal take or, um, you know, rearranging a section and just because I thought, you know, whether I produced a song or not, I wasn't really looking at it that way. I was just looking at it like, how can we make this album better and how can I help? I wasn't even thinking of it like I'm going to be executive producer or da, da da da. I just was around so much and I heard so many things that I just started doing it. And like, you know, at the end of it, he gave me that title and I, you know, I appreciated it because we, we put a lot of work in. Well, I think, I think one thing, um, from working in music, but also working in the startup space, mm -hmm. uh, from working at startup companies, I really realized that music and uh, startups had this amazing parallel. Um, but I think what I'm, what I'm learning about uh, your description of a co-executive producer, it's almost like a product manager, like mm -hmm. a person who just makes sure things are like running smoothly and they give their input and they're just helping with the flow of the project to completion. Um, yeah, like I felt like like my my job was to help him clearly realize his intentions for the project. You know what I mean? That was how I looked at it. Like, and we had a conversation where I asked him, I was like, what, 
are your intentions for this? You know, I did that with him on Born Sinner too. Um, but the intentions were different on that album. On this album, the intention was to tell the story of um, this character. That changed all the decisions because when that's the sole intention, um, certain songs get left off, even if they might be great songs. It's like a song like False Prophets. Like, that's probably one of the best songs he's done in, like, a long time. But, like, it just didn't... It wasn't part of the narrative. It didn't fit the... Um, the story so we had to you know we had to remove it so that it could be it, it could be a, a streamlined piece of art you know like that was the point and um you know this is, it was some tough calls but i think at the end of the day it um it made a statement and that's what we were trying to do on this one it wasn't about like sales or or how many singles or how many big records or how many you know songs people would want to just like bump in their car or whatever it was like that was not an that was not even in consideration it was just about this narrative and um, the statement that he wanted to make with the story, you know? So we, we focused on that and streamlined it to be that. Describe the process of making Crooked Smile. What was that process like from beginning to end uh, of the making of that song? Uh, well, it started with a live performance that he did. You can find it on YouTube somewhere, but it was like, it was like a uh, rock was on the keys and um, it was like an a cappella, I think, where he's just playing the keys, and it was like this, these chords from, from the Jennifer Hudson sample that we ended up using. I think Cole had another beat with that sample in it, and Ron might have just heard it or something and just decided to play it. Um, and um, Cole did this verse. I think it was the first verse on Crooked Smell. Um but it was just like the spur of the moment thing. It wasn't planned or nothing. It was just like one of those things at the show where he's just like, oh, I'll just do this verse over this piano thing. They tell me I should fix my grill because I got money now. I ain't going to sit around in front like I ain't thought about it. A perfect smile is more appealing, but it's funny how my shit is crooked. Look at me, I'm crooked. Yeah, 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 I'm cr
a TLC song where like I'm pretty, I'm pretty, like one I'm pretty. Them. Yeah. Like, so, um, and I was always a huge TLC fan. So I was just happy as hell at the idea. I was like, Oh my God, that would be like, that would be like a full circle for me. Like just as far as, um, my life, like it would be amazing, you know? Um, but I think that was his idea and he just like, uh, reached out to them and they had, they had so happened to be working at the time. So it just kind of, the timing was right. Another song that I want to uh, inquire more about is the making of one of my favorite songs off the la- off the latest album, um, Folding Clothes. So mm. how did that come about? Folding Clothes, uh, Cole had some drums that he had did. Those were some of them. He had a bunch of them, but that was one of them. And he sent them to Steve Lacey from the internet, the guitar player from the internet. Yeah. And uh, Steve did, he's really dope, by the way. I'm a big fan of his. He did um, the bass line and the guitar stuff on there. And uh, they produced that together. And um, I came in and, like, added some stuff at the end, like some of the, some of the breakdowns and stuff, just with arrangements and, like, um, you know, little things. But, uh, and help with, like, the mix. You know, little stuff. But, like, that was really, I think, actually, when Cole, that was one of the last songs for the album that he did. It, and um, it was like he was just if it was one of those songs where he was just messing around like he was just down there having fun like singing out loud and I think he laid it down like real quick and it was like I came down I remember I was just like yo this is crazy actually like yeah fire like this should probably be on the project um so he and then he did another one that was kind of similar um right afterwards but it almost made it but it didn't quite make the cut at the last minute but he was in just a zone of just having fun and feeling good and and it kind of came out pretty organically pretty naturally the last question that i want to ask you what were some of the growing pains you experienced uh, as a producer and what advice would you give uh, to expiring producers um well growing pains that i experienced was basically for me it was like having success early and then and not understanding why and like how you know because you you're still figuring out your craft so to have success early can be a bit of a um confusing thing you know when you're start you can start looking for approval from others and i think people go through that regardless like just looking for approval from others as opposed to doing it because you enjoy doing it and looking for your own for your own satisfaction um but if the advice I would give to producers, number one, is your intake and input. Like, what you input to your mind musically is the most important thing. Like, the amount of time you spend studying other people, great people. Like, don't just listen to um, what everyone else is listening to. Make sure you go and research, like, the best of the best because then you're getting the shortcuts and, like, the you're, you're gonna your palate is going to be you know, that much better. So, you know, usually the best musicians listen to the best music. Um, they have the best taste. So like, I would say that's the most important thing within the second most important thing. You just have to put in hours, man. Like you got to really spend time and, um, dedicate yourself to, to the craft. And, um, it's no shortcuts, you know, you have to, you have to practice, you have to, you have to, uh, refine your skills. And, um, you know, I'm always doing that. Like I, I never, uh, I feel like I'm doing that more now than I ever was, where it's just like I'm trying to learn new things, like learn instruments, learn, um, get better at arranging, get better at, you know, get better, get better, get better. Like, that's the goal. So, like, you know, you got to put in hours to get better. So there's no shortcuts. There's no magic trick. There's no, you know, um, secret drum sounds that you can use that will make your beats dope. Like, there's no equipment or program that you can use that's going to make your shit good, like, it all comes down to how much how much time you put into it and how seriously you take it. So that's it. Well, Elite, thank you so much uh, for being a guest on the Silent Giants podcast. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, you've been a, a nice guy to me every single time I meet you on the street or, mm-hmm. you know, happen to be in the studio with you. So, And I wish you all the best of luck, man. No problem, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, brother.